Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Right now, it's absolutely beautiful outside. Yes. <laughs> Drove in with the windows down. This afternoon, the windows be up tight and the air on high. Yeah. Oh, if you have air. If you have air, that, that is definitely a need. Well, for those of you that are watching online, please give us a shout out in the comments. I know a couple of you already have, so thank you for that. Let us know you're watching. Um, we'd love for you to sometime join us in the future, right here in person, where the area is on. So, so this uh, Wednesday, so last Sunday, we kicked off uh, the Bible uh, sermon series, and we're going to continue that today uh, with Journey from Slavery to Freedom, but on Wednesday night, it came to life because we actually purchased and have not just the DVDs, but we got the license so that we can watch it. And uh, we'll be watching episode two. And for those of you that were here on Wednesday, you got to see the little tease. But it's Moses, and he walks up to the Red Sea with his staff and puts his staff down. And the special effects, you know, we don't know what happened, but special effects are the whirlwind of the water going around him and then the giant walls as the Israelites pass through. So join us for that on. Uh, Wednesday as we watch episode two of that 10-week uh, series, so uh, we're looking forward to that. Since we like to show things, we're going to jump ahead a couple of weeks, and our movie night is on the 27th at 6 o'clock. The uh, doors will open at 5.30, and as always, uh, the movie is free, as are the concessions. So there'll be drinks, there'll be uh, hot dogs, there'll be popcorn, um, brownie bites, uh, maybe some other things, I don't know. It's, those are the things that are always here. So, and they're free, like I said, until, as long as the supplies last. So join us for that. It is an incredible movie. Joe Smallbone from For King and Country is in the lead of this movie. And he plays the part of James and James in need of money and in hopes of regaining custody of his daughter, he embarks on this cross country delivery for cash, no questions asked experience and in other words don't open the back of the truck to see what's in there and ultimately he discovers that he is delivering two young women and the questions in his mind really begin to haunt him and this movie is while it's it's not that old it's timeless in the fact that human trafficking exists and there's a, a list circulating on social media right now that lists the worst places like for truck stops in the country for human trafficking so it's a very uh, important topic uh, there's a group here locally called chains interrupted um, just happen to know the original director of that group she's from my hometown so i was always kind of neat but uh, she actually served under President Trump in the capacity of human trafficking on a, on a special for task force. So um, very important that uh, we understand what this is. And Doug's already watched it. He's gonna watch it again, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. of course. But he, I believe your suggestion is Kleenexes yes. out all no. for everybody. So we'll make sure to do that. We don't know how to show a movie without Kleenex. So we'll make sure to have plenty of those for you. Um, if you are curious about watching that trailer to understand more about it, just go to GraceStreet.Church in the upper right-hand corner, click on Grace Street Cinema, and the trailer will be right there. For those of you watching online, it will also be in the playlist uh, that will be being posted with the songs. So at the very end of all the songs, you can watch that, and uh, we'll be showing it at the end of the, the service here as well. And then we're going to not take a break. We're just going to immediately rush into men's breakfast on August 3rd. And uh, yeah, that looks like some of the stuff that we'll have. Uh, there'll be plenty of more food. Um, it's The food is maybe ever-changing except for the biscuits and gravy. Because, you know, we don't want Denny to stop coming because there's no biscuits and gravy. But uh, the, the time together, the fellowship amongst the men, the time of devotion, those are the things that don't change. Those are the things that strengthen us. And as the proverb said, iron sharpens iron. 
So we invite all the men, uh, whether you are part of our ministry here or not, we look forward to having you join us. So men, that means invite other guys to join us. We can talk about cars, and then we'll get into uh, devotion time. And then following that next, uh, following Saturday, we'll have our next itineration of Orange Track Racing. So August 10th, uh, registration 930 with racing at 10 o'clock. And so we look forward to seeing everyone there for that. And then finally, again, the playlist that I mentioned, yeah, Mark's gonna be putting that up in the, in the feed for you. And uh, we hope that you can take those songs that he has uh, put together and tie, and they will tie into the message today to help you uh, finish your time of worship this morning and also just enhance the message that we're about to hear. So Father God, as we begin this morning's time of worship, we just come before you. We lay it all out before you, Father. We have all kinds of things going on in our lives. It may be a struggle that we're going through, maybe financially, maybe physically, mentally, spiritually, Father. But scripture tells us, Father, that we're no longer slaves to those things because of you. So we thank you, Father. Father, hear the words that we are praying to you. Hear, let us hear the words that you are saying to us. It's a two-way communication, Father. Help us to hear those words and use them in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Romans 6, 16 and 18. Paul writes this. He says, don't you realize that you became the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Anything that we put our priority in, we can become slaves to. I became a slave to work, and I wore being a workaholic as a badge of honor. It's not. I learned that the hard way. God allowed me to crash and not burn up totally, fortunately, but I crashed and burned. But because I had made that my God, and that's not what it is. Paul is saying that this part is individual to us. This is the part where we can go back to God's grace and be made righteous in his eyes. It's a commitment. So, and, and we've talked about this many times before. When you wake up, the first thing you should do is go before God and thank Him for the day. It might even be so simple as, Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you've given. Help me to not sin today. But as I put my feet on the ground, may I walk in your ways, in your light, being a beacon for your kingdom. Father, let my slavery to sin go away and make my commitment to you ever stronger. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, as we accidentally turn off our microphone, Father, as we invite Pastor Mark up here to bring us this message this morning, this message about the journey from slavery into freedom, Father, we pray a special blessing upon him. We pray that the words that come out of his mouth are the words that we hear and that we take in and that we learn from because you have given these words to him. You have ordained him to provide us this message. And Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. How's everybody today? 
this is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So on my way to church this morning, I rolled the windows down in my car, 71 degrees, beautiful, nice breeze coming through, rained a little bit this morning. And so as I'm driving down the street, I'm just enjoying everything and it was just so wonderful. Then I kept getting whacked in the face by all the rain that was on my car was spitting back at me. So I had to roll my windows up. But you know, it was refreshing. It's a good reminder that, you know, in the midst of all the junk that's going on in the world today and all the problems and all the hassles, that we can get cleansed from it. And God sends a cleansing into our lives each and every day. We have to open our eyes and realize it. So in our background that I had uh, up here today, which you'll see in the background for all the slides, is, uh, is a background of some people on a trail, a rocky little trail kind of winding its way down through the hills and deserts and everything like that. They all have backpacks on, you know? And, and kind of what the illustration I wanted to use for that today was that, you know, we're all carrying some baggage along with us on our trail. And the trail may not be nice, smooth, paved trail or whatever it happens to be. We're going to have rocks along the way that we have to deal with. We're going to have things that might pop off the side of the trail and, and you know, kind of join with us on our, on our uh, walk. I'm reminded of when I was in Boy Scouts and we were down in Cimarron, New Mexico, Philmont Scout Reservation down there and we're hiking through the mountains down there and there's rattlesnakes everywhere. And I mean everywhere. So you couldn't take a hike in the mountains down there without finding a rattlesnake or five. Um, but you never know what's going to join you on that trail. You know, it could be a mountain lion to come chasing down the side of the hill at you. Uh, but see, that's the thing. As Christians, we're going to have that baggage that we're going to carry with us on our journey through life. And that baggage is sin. And so the mini series that we're going through, the Bible mini series, we're in week two. And this is the journey from slavery to freedom. And so that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. Our key scripture that I'm going to be teaching from today is from Joshua 2, 1 through 21, and 6, 20 through 25. And if you want to join along in your Bibles, it's on page 158. How's that? But I have a question that I want to ask you this morning. What is your history? What is your history? <coughs> well, we all have history. And as humans, we all have a history, a heritage, a past, and that may be good or it may be bad, depending upon the actions of our ancestors. You've got to kind of think of it that way. See, once those actions are set forth, they remain for all time. You cannot rewrite the past. You can only write a new future for you. And I want you to hang on to that thought process because we can't go back and, and erase what happened in the past. The past is the past. And we got to leave it there. But a lot of us carry it around as baggage with us through each and every day of our lives. And especially, we don't carry the good things with us. We tend to carry all the bad baggage with us that weighs us down in life. And it kind of keeps us from being able to experience the good life, the fulfilled life that God wants for us. So nearly every family has that set of beloved stories that they like to tell over and over again. You know, especially if you have a family reunion, you're, I have somebody that is in our family who, I, especially like on Lori's birthday, I get to hear that story. I've heard it 34 <laughs> times. <laughs> Yeah. I digress. Okay, it may be how Grandpa came over to the country with only five dollars in his pocket, and now you know he built a life for himself and the family. Or it could be that you have an ancestor along your lines that fought in a famous war or something like that. Or it could be a story of a romance or a child's rescue or a moment of accomplishment that someone in your past, your ancestor, did. Or it may be someone in your past that was more nefarious in nature, let's say. But let's face it, we are bound to have some bad in our past at some point in time. It's kind of the law of averages that's going to happen. 
Nevertheless, I was telling everyone last week, and, and this is before I wrote my sermon for this week, uh, I was talking to some of the people about some documents that I found over at Dad's house, uh, Mom and Dad's house, when I was starting to kind of organize to try and clean out their house. And uh, I came upon the Kent Family Bible from the 1800s. And so there, inside that, there's written hand, handwritten dates of birth and death and all these different things that went on. And I found some other documents telling how my great-grandfather was one of the very first settlers that claimed land in Benton County, Iowa. Um, well, it's now Benton County, Iowa. It wasn't Benton County back then. But they founded the area around Bell Plain and Chelsea out there. And it's called Bailey Township, Benton County, Iowa. My grand grandfather's name was Bailey Kent. And so that township is named after him. And I re read all these papers and I learned from reading the papers in the box that I found, which was handed down f to my mother from her mother uh, and father, and was handed down to my grandfather from his father. And so you get these different things that get handed down because history matters. History matters. And I had heard stories of how our family, when I was growing up, because we went out to visit these places as I was a little, little kid, and uh, we built Kent Church, and next to Kent Church is Kent Cemetery, and a little bit down the road from that is Kent School, which was all part of our, our land that we had out there. Um, and this all happened in the 1800s, but I never really realized what all had been done in the area until I read those newspaper clippings. I didn't know about the rest of the story, the Paul Harvey point, portion of it. And, but it's our history that helps define who we are today. And again, that could be good or bad. It depends on what you plan to build your future with. So even if you had a bad past or you had a great past, it's up to you to define what your future is going to be. So last week I spoke about the four components to the story of Abraham and Isaac. And we had history, which I kind of talked about a little bit here today, faith, belief, and salvation. And these were defining moments in the life of Abraham and Isaac, as Terry was telling the story. And I'm sure it was a terrifying time for Isaac being bound up and ready to become a sacrifice to God. It was also a very telling example to Isaac of his father's commitment to God. The strength of his father's faith, the beliefs and obedience that he had to God. And I imagine it was a defining moment in Isaac's uh, faith journey as well. It showed the depth of surrender that Abraham had to have to the will of God and in return then God blessed his family through the generations. See, it's that part of history that is very important to us because we assimilate that history as being children of God. As being children of God, God's history is our history and that's why it's important. So can you imagine the impact that you had of Isaac telling his story to his children? And what do you think that kind of impact would have had on his children's faith journey as well? See, that makes a difference. And that's why they pass these things down from generation to generation to generation. See, in some ways, it's the stories that remember and tell that shape who we are as an individual. They explain where we've come from. They shed light on who we are, and they guide our steps as we move forward in life. And as I mentioned last Sunday, that one of the reasons the Bible is so important or should be important to us it's because it's the story of all of us. From the words of Genesis to the last lines of Revelation, it is our story. As children of God, it is God's story, his words put down, his divinely inspired words to guide us as we move through forward into life. 
The story is timeless because of what it tells us about our history and our generational family tree. So in the Hebrew tradition, they would know their lineage and their social status then depended upon which house they came from. So I'm sure you've heard of the terms of the house of David or the tribes that you had in those days. It was kind of a universal term between tribe and house. So you were kind of defined on who you were as a family, as a person, as your lineage, as your history, by which house that you would then be associated with. And such as it was important to show that connection to Jesus all the way back to David in order to fulfill the prophecies of Scripture written long before the birth of Christ. History matters, in other words. History can tell us the correct path to take and conversely, which one not to take. And also, which path will help guide us and others help us guide others on which is the correct path to take. See, if we don't learn from the mistakes in our past, then we're destined to make those same mistakes again in our future. And if we can help someone else on their journey, on their destination, on their path, in the future by learning from the mistakes we made. You know, I can't tell you how many times I told my kids not to do these things that I did. Don't do as I did, do as I say, uh, and then it'll save you some heartache along the way. And that's why us retelling those stories with the help of this epic made for television program, mini series that we have, appropriately enough, called The Bible, we will be showing the mini series over the next 10 weeks and in doing so, it'll give us a clear picture of our past and why it matters to our future. It kind of ties everything together. The Bible miniseries presents that vast variety and sweeping scope of the Bible stories as a unified whole. So as we think of the Bible, we think most of the time about the Old Testament stuff and we think about the New Testament stuff. But if we really look at the Bible as a whole, through those 66 books in there, it is a retelling of the history of God and the family. It's a history of what the generations and the ancestors went through. So we hopefully won't make those same mistakes in the future. But it also defines on who we are and what we do. So starting on Wednesday night, we get to see an epic that Terry was talking about here, give us a little preview of that, the wall of water, which I talked about last week, and for some of us before the service, I was talking about how they found the area, and they have that 900 foot plateau yeah. that they have found, the chariot wheels that belong to that period, that were only used for this period in time. They found the bodies of the horses, they found weapons, they found bodies of soldiers in there and everything of when that wall came back down on the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. History matters. The neat thing about it is, is as they find these things, it adds the credence to the stories in the Bible that no, they're not just a bunch of made up stories, as some people like to say. But see, that Bible miniseries then helps us to visualize and experience that story in history so that we can find it more relational to our lives today. The story that we're gonna focus on today is gonna to be the story of Rahab. And it's a story that's almost hidden away in the chapters of the sixth book of that Bible, the book of Joshua. But in many ways, it's also our story today. And it's as current as this morning's headlines, but in order to fully appreciate Rahab's story, we have to understand then the backstory, or what I love to call the Paul Harvey moments, the rest of the story, which involves the Exodus. Everybody knows about the Exodus, right? Okay, nobody's hand went up. That's okay. It was the deliverance of God's people from slavery in Egypt and to bring them out into what he had promised in that first covenant message that he had given his people that he was gonna bring them into a land full of milk and honey, right? The land of Canaan, the land of heaven on earth for the Israelite people. And so that Exodus started that journey 
for these people to fulfill the promise that God had made them 600 years earlier. And then it's also that story of how they stumbled along the way. And so it's our story as well because we're still stumbling today. So as the story begins today, the background is this. God's people had been delivered from slavery in Egypt, led through the Red Sea, and had wandered in the Sinai wilderness then for 40 years. Why did they have to wander for 40 years if God promised to bring them into that promised land? Well, guess what? People were people, right? And what did they do? They went against the will of God. They, they abandoned God along the place, even though every day he was giving them food, water, everything provided for them, gave them guidance through the day and through the night, a, an assurance that he was with them every step of the way, but that wasn't good enough. They wanted more. They wanted more. He had fulfilled everything they needed, but they wanted more. Hang on to that thought process. Because it's the same thing we live out day to day, every day. God provides what we need, but we always seem to want more. And so we go to God with Christmas lists like he's Santa Claus. God, I really want this, and I want this, and I want this. God says, well, you know, you're not getting your prayers answered because you don't need it. Or not now. Maybe later. So they wandered through the Sinai wilderness for four years. There they received God's law, and it united them as a nation, but they were still nomads. They were still wandering without a home, living out of tents, living day to day. They were existing, but not truly living a fulfilled life that God wanted for them. And why? Because they were disobedient to God, but he still provided for them regardless. Another key thing to think about. So the promised land was not yet theirs. And in order for that to happen, they had to conquer the most fortified city in the entire land. And one of the last few lines in the clip says, you'll be passed over. And that's in reference to Exodus 40 years earlier that God's people had since celebrated every year in the Passover celebration. And if we remember what happened there, anyone who is faithful to God would take the blood of a lamb and put it over the doorposts on, and the, the shadow of death would pass them by. And likewise, in here, this is kind of the same thing that they were going through here. And it's a recognition that something like that is going to happen again. So for Rahab and her family, as recorded in the first chapters of the book of Joshua, it kind of tells us a related story then to what was going to be. And as I said before, this is not just Rahab's story, but it's yours and mine too, at least in several ways. And the first way is this. In Joshua 2, verses 1 through 3, it says that Joshua secretly sent out two spies to an Israelite camp in Acacia Grove. And he instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and there they stayed that night. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. So now Jericho, was see, it was a very strategic choice to be in there. Uh, it was a heavily fortified, it was the world's oldest known fortified city at the time. It was considered impregnable by any enemy. Its defeat would have made the headlines, so to speak. It would have had struck fear into all of those in the surrounding territories, because we all know word of mouth spreads very quickly. So this is kind of the backstory. The defeat of Jericho then would have uh, struck fear into them, and the reason it would be, if Jericho can be defeated, we don't stand a chance. So when we think about the story of, of Joshua and Jericho in there, we don't understand some of the backstory in here. 
but this is the backstory that helps tell the history and why this is such an important story in the Bible. But Rahab, on the other hand, seems like a very strange choice. Who is Rahab? Well, she was a prostitute, right? She's referred to as a prostitute in the Bible account. And that it's not as such an auspicious start to her story, it may have been understandable from the spy's viewpoint, if we take it from that viewpoint. Two men entering her house may not have elicited much suspicion in them coming into her house, because it was kind of a common occurrence. And the location of her house was built into the city wall, so if they needed to make an escape, it would have made that escape much, much easier. But still, she was a prostitute, right? How would you like for your autobiography to start out like that? Rahab the prostitute. This is your story. How would you like your story to be preserved forever with those words? Well, guess what? It kind of does. It kind of does. So in my last message, I asked whose sin was worse, that of a kid who stole the penny candy in the store or a murderer? You see, in God's eyes, sin is sin is sin. And as I had told you, we all tend to put sin on that sliding scale, and we try and justify the reasoning of sin. Well, he was probably just hungry, and that's why he took the candy, right? Or we try and trivialize our sin by playing it down and comparing our sin to somebody else's. Yes, I stole the money, but I didn't murder anybody, okay? Well, guess what? Justifying sin is a sin. Now who's the bad one? See, we have to understand what sin is in the eyes of God. We're a child of God. If your child sins against you, it doesn't make you happy, does it? Okay, now think about God. Think about all the children of God. We're all sinners, right? Well, Rahab's story was that of a sinner, just like you and I. Just like you and I. Her story was just like ours. Dress it up however you like, but that's how every human story begins. Maybe not as a prostitute, but as a sinner of one kind or another. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in Romans 3.23. So I want to give you another quick Greek lesson today. The Greek word used in that passage there is a word called pas, P-A-S. I put the Greek spelling up there for you too. I know you guys have been studying it, so. But it translates to the whole, every kind of, and all. I, I, I love the way the Greeks have their language because it has so many meanings to it. One simple three-letter word translates to the whole. The whole of every person then is sin. All have sinned. The whole means everybody has sinned. Every kind of person has sinned. All have sinned. Amazing, isn't it? All have sinned. Not some. All. Every last one of us. Bad as that is, it gets worse. Ready for this? Okay. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. John 8, 34. Your sin may seem more respectable than mine, but it's still sin, and it's still slavery, according to Jesus. So every one of us, all, the whole, everybody included, nobody's left out, no matter who you are, the guy standing up in front of you, we're all sinners, and we're all a slave to sin. So just looking at these on the surface, we need to realize that it's kind of a st sad state of affairs that we live in. We all fall short. We all fall short. We are all slaves to sin. We all have baggage that we carry around with us. It's a very sad story. But it's not the whole story. It's not the whole story. 
see a lot of us carry around bags full of guilt for things that we did in our past, mistrust, misdeeds, things that we can't seem to get rid of. And yes, at times we go to God and we, we put those sins, those bags of baggage at the feet of the cross. And then invariably what we do in our humanness is we pick up those bags after we left them there and he took care of them and we take them back from him. And we carry those bags around with us. He set us free and we take them back. See, that's kind of the way, the, another way in which Rahab's story is true of you and me. And that is that her story involved a choice. If we go back to Joshua 2 through 14, let's look at that text. It goes on to say this. But the woman had taken two men and hidden them. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I didn't know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up to them. But see, she had already taken them up to the roof and hidden them under some stalks of flax that she had laid on on the roof. So the king's men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, then the gate was shut. Before the spies laid down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did in Sihon and Og the two kings of the Amorites in the east of the Jordan whom you completely destroyed when we heard of it our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my brother and my sisters and all who belong to them, that you will save us from this death. And the spies who were Caleb and Joshua they said, our lives are your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. Now, it's easy to read a story like this without not fully understanding, so let's not do that. We, we want to have a good understanding of what's going on here. We need to understand the gravity of the situation before we can understand and grasp the magnitude of the sacrifice. Sound somewhat familiar? I talked about that in the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. In order for us to understand the magnitude of our sins, we cannot understand the magnitude of his sacrifice for us. So we need to understand the gravity of this situation before we can understand the magnitude of the sacrifice that she made. So let's take a minute to put ourselves in Rahab's shoes. She faced a decision. She could have turned the spies away. She could have turned them in. She didn't have to help them. She could have just stayed with the status quo, kept the way things were, because, you know, it's always easier that way rather than actually getting involved. The safe choice probably would have been to stay out of the line of fire completely. Had she been caught, she would have been put to death. So she had a choice to make, and she made a bold choice. We need to understand the gravity of the situation before we can comprehend the magnitude of the sacrifice. Rahab had a choice to make. Given a choice between the side that God was on and the other side, she chose the side of God. She chose the side of God. And it makes you wonder if something was driving her to make a change in her life. If that still small voice was speaking to her and urging her on to make a choice and make a change. I wonder if she was ready to be somewhere else in her life. I wonder if the status quo felt more like the status no to her. She, she was tired of living that out. 
and needed a change. I wonder if she was ready to be somebody else. Maybe some of us here today are like that. Maybe someone here who the status quo feels more like the status no. Or maybe there's somebody here who's ready to be somewhere else. To be someone else. Maybe you don't like who you used to be or what you did in the past and you're carrying all that baggage with you each and every day. Maybe you realize the fact that you have become a slave to your sins and you want to be somewhere else besides being trapped into those sins. Maybe you're ready for a change. Maybe you want to be someone other than the person that you've been in your past. Maybe you are the someone who's ready to be set free. Maybe you're ready to be set free. Well, do you know our God is a God who specializes in setting the captives free? Remember Joseph's story? The kid brother who was sold into slavery in Egypt. All the stuff he went through. God not only got him through and out of that slavery and out of prison, he made Joseph the prime minister of the whole land of Egypt. And we kind of know some of the rest of that story as well. Remember the story of Joseph's ancestors in Egypt. They were enslaved by the Egyptians until uh, God sent a man named Moses to them who led his people out of slavery. God set his people free. He heard their cries. He heard their cries and he sent someone to them to bring them out of the captivity of the slavery that they were under. And brought them to freedom. Remember the story of Israel in the time of the judges. Year after year, generation after generation, they strayed away from God and what his will was and his ways. And they were repeatedly oppressed and enslaved by a secession of nations. And repeatedly, God sent leaders, judges, or what they were called in the day, means a little bit different from the judges of today. But they were leaders that, and they were called to deliver the people out of that bondage, out of that slavery, and bring them into freedom. We worship a God that sets captives free. He takes our baggage. He shatters our bonds. He delivers us from that sin. That's slavery to sin. But see, he won't do so without our consent. Remember what I've told you before. Before God can do his part, we have to do our part. We have to invite him into that situation. We have to invite him into our lives in order for God to make a change in our lives. He needs to know that we are willing to make the change and do what's necessary. Think of it this way. Jesus couldn't have changed water into wine without being invited to the wedding, the party first. He couldn't have done that miracle. That was the very first miracle he ever performed. But see, he had to be invited to the party first. Like Rahab, each of us face a decision each and every day, sin or salvation, slavery or freedom. Simple choices, one or the other, either or. But yet some of the most difficult choices we have to make because we are slaves to our own sinful nature. Well, if you haven't done so, I hope today is the day that you will say no to the status quo. Things don't have to stay the same as they always are. I hope you're someone here today who's ready to be somewhere else in their life. I hope you're today to be that someone here that wants to be someone else other than who they've been in their past. I hope there's someone here who's ready to be set free, to get rid of the baggage once and for all, and to invite Jesus into the party. Invite Jesus to your party daily, because we sin daily. And it's the only way that we can break the chains, is we have to pray daily to be set free daily to be set free well if there is anyone here that fits any of those there's one more part to Rahab's story the rest of the story which could become your story too and that is our story is marked by a scarlet cord 
I discard a card. Joshua 2, 15 to 21, and 6, 20 to 25. So she let them down by a rope through the window for the house she lived on was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers won't find you. Hide yourselves there for three days until they return, and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, this oath that you made us swear will not be binding on us unless we enter the land. You have tied this scarlet cord on the window through which you let us down. Unless you have brought your father and your mother and your brothers and your sisters and all into your family into your house. If any of them go outside of your house and into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath that you made us swear. And so she agreed. Let it be as you say. Now the old English term for that is so mote it be, or the word that we say is amen. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord to the window. A scarlet cord, red like blood, hanging outside the city wall. And of course you probably know how the story ends. Israel surrounded the city and marched around it every day for six days. And then on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. And when they had done so, the sixth chapter of Joshua records the result. When the trumpets sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. But Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all that belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. What a change. Rahab, the prostitute, there it goes, says it again. She was a sinner, and yet she was saved by a choice. She made a choice. By a scarlet cord hung outside the wall. And in doing so, she not only found a place of acceptance among the people of God, but she became the great-grandmother of King David who, from whose loyal, royal line, Jesus, the Messiah, has ascended. Now that's quite a journey. From Rahab the prostitute to Rahab the progenitor of Jesus Christ, our Lord. All from a sinner and a scarlet cord hang outside the city wall. See, that's her story. That's ours too, if you let it be. The scripture says, when the time arrived that was sent by God the Father, God sent his son born among us of a woman, born under the conditions of the law so that he might redeem those who have been kidnapped by the law. Thus we have been set free to experience our rightful heritage. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. No matter how much baggage you have, no matter how bad you think you are, no matter how hopeless your situation you think is, you can be set free. You can be set free today. You can be made acceptable in the sight of God because the Bible says Jesus suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Red blood passed over from the shadow of death. The blood of Jesus washing us clean, setting us free from slavery to sin, to freedom in his presence with God. The choice, however, is yours. Freedom's in front of you. It can be yours by the means of a simple prayer, which I invite you to pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, Thank you for suffering outside the city walls, for shedding your blood to secure my salvation. I confess I'm a sinner. I'm in need of your grace and mercy. 
I turn to you right here, right now, and I claim your sacrifice on the cross as payment for all the wrong things I've done. I pray that by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus that I will be redeemed. I ask you to come into my heart. Take charge of my life from this moment on. Now, if you prayed that prayer along with me for the first time, the Bible says you have passed from slavery into freedom. You have been set free to experience your rightful heritage as a child of God. Welcome to the family of God. See, that's all it takes. Belief. Terry and I would welcome the opportunity to meet with you and pray with you after the service concludes. If you prayed this from your heart for the first time. Our call to worship this morning came from Romans 6, 16 to 18. Don't you realize that you become slave to whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which he gives you righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slave to sins, but now you wholeheartedly obey his teachings, which we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin. You become slaves to righteous living. See, it's your choice. Choose wisely. And for all of us, let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for the freedom that is ours in Christ Jesus. Please help us, each one, to live that freedom by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for saving us from sin day by day and moment by moment. And thank you for delivering us from the sin so easily entangles us, freeing us from the habits and addictions that drag us down, bind us in ways that are contrary to your world for us. Help us to live out our rightful heritage as children of God. In Jesus' name, so mote it be. Let your will be done. Each time we listen to the message, uh, we study the Bible. Each time we come together. For me, the breaking of this bread becomes more and more important. It's not something that just all of a sudden is important because of Jesus dying on the cross for us. It's as our relationship grows as we continue to move forward leaving that history behind, leaving that baggage behind, putting those things at the foot of the cross. Realizing that we are made righteous in the Father's eyes because of what this represents. For it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread, blessed it, and then broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take me. Then towards the end of the meal, after singing some hymns, he took the cup and he filled it. And the color does not get lost on us. Because this is representative of his blood. He lifts the cup, he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many and drink. As often as we do this, we are to do so in remembrance of not just Jesus himself, but for what he has done for us and continues to do for us. He continues to intercede as he sits at the right hand of the Father on our behalf from eternity to eternity. body of Christ broken for you. Take me.
and the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Heavenly Father, let this be a reminder of what you have done for us. But let it be an ever-deepening understanding of that fact. What you did was in your plan from the beginning, from eternity to eternity. Father, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. Thank you that we can leave our history where it belongs in the past and come before you righteous. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>
It says in your word to come to the Father, cast your cares upon him, and he will give you rest. Help us to do and act in your word, Father God. Father, uh, we pray for the people that are suffering through the hurricanes that hit this past week. Loss of life, people were without places to live, without power. Father, we ask that you guide these people through these tragedies. Help them to see you in the storm. Let you be their tower of refuge that will sustain them through this trial in their lives. For you want people to depend on you for all things, to glorify you even when their hearts are in despair. So you will restore them and they can witness to others of the miracle works you have done for them. Because you wish that not one person should perish, but all should find everlasting life through your son Jesus who died on the cross to save us from our sins. We praise you for all that you do for us. And Father, we lift up our children and grandchildren. Please put Christian people in their lives so they will find you in all aspects of their daily lives. Walk with them and talk with them. Be their guide in this dark world. As in Colossians 3.17 states, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We honor and praise you, Lord Jesus, for loving us unconditionally. Please guide us and protect us. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. There's so much that we need to pray for in this world today, and uh, yesterday's tragedy is a, is a reminder of the division and the divisiveness that we need to pray against, yes. and we need to claim a victory over in Jesus' name. Amen. As this comes to our end of our online portion of our service today, we thank you for joining us online. Uh, we ask that you would go ahead and click on the links for the music and be able to enjoy those because those are a message in music as well that hopefully will tie into the message that you heard in word today. And uh, ask this blessing upon you right now. Lord God, we just praise you and thank you that we were able to hear your word in so many different ways today. Let it speak to our hearts and that we would take it in and that we would live it out each and every day. Lord, help us to break that slavery to sin. Help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to be the reflection of you to others in our lives so that when they look upon us, they look upon you and they can see your face living in our lives. Lord, we praise you and thank you for all the many blessings you give us each and every day. We ask for your redeeming grace, for your mercy, and for your protection, your guidance in our lives and through our lives each and every day. Go in peace and go with God.